Hello, dear students. Today, our lecture is about polymorphism and mutations. This is our lecture outline. First of all, we'll discuss general concepts. Then we'll discuss the nature of genetic variation. Uh, we'll discuss, of course, different types of polymorphisms, and we'll discuss different types of mutations as well. But first of all, let's discuss general concepts, okay? So, genetic diversity may manifest as differences in the organization of the human genome. They may manifest as nucleotide changes in the genome sequence. They may manifest as variation in the copy number of large segments of DNA, as well as alterations in the structure or amount in the pro of the proteins, and or um, any of these in the context of clinical diseases. We know that sequence of nuclear DNA is about 99.5% identical between any two unrelated individuals. And it is very small fraction of the DNA sequence difference among individuals that is responsible for the genetically determined variability. So basically it is 0.5% that makes each of us distinct and different from one another. So what makes us different from each other? The answer is polymorphisms. Many DNA sequence differences have little or no effect on outward appearance, whereas other differences are directly responsible for causing certain human diseases. And between these two extremities, it is the variation responsible for genetically determined variability in anatomy, physiology, dietary intolerance, susceptibility to infections, predisposition to cancer, some therapeutic responses or even adverse reactions to different medications, and perhaps even variability in various personality traits, um, maybe athletic aptitude or artistic talent or um, talent to music or arts or math, so these are, this is kind of uh, intermediate between these two extremities. And polymorphists usually do not directly cause the disease, but they may, of course, increase susceptibility to diseases. Polymorphists, again, promote diversity, genetic variation, and even adaptation to different various environmental changes. And uh, polymorphists are heritable, and they may be modified by natural selection. And often uh, polymorphisms persist over many generations because no single form has an overall advantage over the other forms. So polymorphisms again mean existence of many forms, right? Poly means many form, morpho means form, right? And uh, polymorphisms again mean that these are just the differences between humans, but there is no advantage of one um, type of polymorphism over the other, like blood groups, right? So there is no advantage over having blood type A or B or AB or O. Uh, let's discuss the concept of mutation and the concept of polymorphism. So we know that the segment of DNA that occupies a particular position or location on a chromosome, we call this locus, and plural word, uh, word means lo loci, loci. A locus may be large segment of DNA that contains many genes, so kind of a segment of the chromosome, for example. A locus we can refer to as a single gene, for example, beta globin gene locus. And locus may be just a single base in the genome, um, for example, as it's in the case of a single nucleotide variant. Um, alternative versions of the DNA sequence in a particular locus is called allele, right? And allele may be of two types, maybe wild type or normal or common or pre prevalent allele, um, usually present in more than half of the individuals in a population. So wild type means it's a normal, it's common allele in a population. And variant or mutant allele is the one that differs from the wild type allele because of the presence of mutation. And mutation is a permanent change in the nucleotide sequence or arrangement of DNA. And we need to notice over here that uh, both um, 
mutations in both polymorphs, they are inherited. These are DNA changes, right? Uh, just mutations were for pathogenic changes, and polymorphs are common normal variations of the genes, right? And over here, we also need to notice that the term mutation or mutant refers only to the DNA, but this does not refer to human beings who carry muta mutant adults. So the frequency of different variants can differ in different populations around the globe. And if there are two or more relatively common alleles, and the frequency is more than 1% in a given population, uh, right, uh, the locus, uh, we say, it exhibits polymorphism, so existence of many forms. For example, ABO blood types, as we uh, mentioned, right? So a single locus, a person may carry a gene sequence that produces A blood type or B blood type or even AB or O blood type, right? And the frequency in the general population is way much more than 1%. Um, talking about the concept of mutation, so mutation ranges from the uh, change of a single nucleotide to alterations of an entire chromosome. So the, the size of mutations may be different, right? Being just one nucleotide change or uh, extra or missing um, chromosome. And in order to recognize a change means that there has to be a reference sequence. So a reference sequence, uh, let's note over here that it has been derived from the Human Genome Project, right? And we refer to it as um, to it as uh, um, like normal sequence, right? Um, and um, when we compare the sequence of uh, individual, we see that this uh, sequence differs or does not differ from the reference sequence. And as more and more genomes from individuals around the globe are sampled, this reference genome is subject to constant evaluation and change. So we can classify mutations by size. Uh, this may be chromosome mutations, regional or subchromosomal mutations, and gene or DNA mutations. So chromosomal mutations means that mutation, it leaves the chromosomes, it, 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 in this case, in chromosomal mutations, the structure of each individual chromosome is fine, is, is good, but the problem is that the number is not uh, normal, right? So the number of chromosomes in, in the cells is abnormal. Regional or subchromosomal mutations means that the number of chromosomes is fine, but the structure is abnormal. And the structural rearrangements may involve parts of uh, one or more chromosomes. And gene or DNA mutations mean that this alter, this uh, changes alter the sequence of the DNA. And these may be substitutions or deletions or insertions of the DNA, like missing mutations or frame shift and so on, right? And it ranges from single nucleotides from, um, to up to um, 100 KB change. The functional consequences of DNA mutations may range from benign, completely benign, to causing some serious illnesses. And it all depends on the precise location, nature, and the size of the mutation. For example, even a mutation within a coding exon of a gene may have no effect on how a gene is expressed if the change does not alter the primary amino acid sequence of the polypeptide chain. Remember, we mentioned in the mutations um, before that um, there may be a, a base pair change, uh, but because of the diversity of genetic code, it still may code for the same amino acid. And it means that the changes, even though by its nature, it's a change in the DNA sequence, does not have any consequence. Um, and therefore, uh, not all mutations manifest in individuals. And here I would like to emphasize your uh, attention. And I've put this uh, really nice uh, photo of Kif Khan and stop using the word mutation. 
because uh, what, um, what has happening over the last few years in genetics is that um, uh, in, in, in medical society, we tend to use the word mutation less and less. And we tend to use uh, a term which we call pathogenic variant more and more. Because any change in the DNA is a variation. So it's a variant, it's an allele, right? And variants may be pathogenic, so a change in the DNA may be pathogenic that causes a disease, right? Or a change may be in the DNA, but it does not, it's not causing anything, and then we say it's benign. So um, from 2015, um, according to the guidelines of American College of Medical Genetics, any change in the DNA is um, we need to classify according to five uh, class classification and we call this um, either pathogenic or second likely pathogenic or rules which is um, known as variant of uncertain significance likely benign and benign so any change that is found in an individual in any of the gene right that differs from the reference sequence we classify it as pathogenic or likely pathogenic or variant of unknown significance or likely benign or benign so what it means is that if for example we uh, make a, a genetic analysis and we find a change in the known gene and uh, we find a change that has already been described in several databases or resources or um, scientific literature and the phenotype of the patient is similar this is similar to the phenotype produced by this disease um, then we say this is pathogenic this is truly pathogenic change the other times we may um, uh, we may encounter a change in the gene, and we know it's a known disease causing gene. For example, um, the gene um, CFTR gene, for example, that causes cystic fibrosis, uh, genetic disease, and then we um, we see that the uh, phenotype of our patient with this specific change fits to the phenotype produced by this gene just um, the issue is that this very particular change in the sequence of the dna yet has not been described in any of the uh, known literature resources or databases and then uh, because the phenotype fits the uh, known disease um, we classify it as likely pathogen now, B9 and likely B9 are the ones that we know these are common variants, these are common in the population, and we know they're not associated with the disease. And um, sort of the biggest headache is this uh, third um, category of VUS, the US variant of unknown significance, is that the change that has been um, detected in the known gene, um, it's a novel change, this change has not been described in any of the literature resources, and then we also, of course, mandatorily and importantly look at the phenotype of the patient, whether the phenotype of the patient fits the phenotype produced by this gene. And then we realize that the phenotype of patient somehow uh, is similar to the uh, disease produced by this gene, but also it does not really completely uh, completely uh, fit with the known phenotype. And then we classify this VUS. And um, in order to uh, reclassify BUS um, to pathogenic or benign, because we need to know um, whether certain change uh, is causative for the disease or it's not causative, uh, of course, one of the important things is to uh, check the parents, right? For example, if we talk about autosomal dominant disease and we realize that we have rules in a patient, in an affected child, and then we go ahead and check the parents and if we do not detect the same variant in any of the parents then we realize that this is the novel change right and uh, we realize that okay uh, because parents are healthy they do not have the variant and the child is affected and child has this variant then most probably this disease causing and later reclassification happens
So these variant classifications is constantly um, updated and it's not somehow fixed because as more and more information accumulates and as more and more um, genomes are sequenced, uh, we better understand what certain variants are doing, whether they're benign or whether they're pathogenic. And here I've put the screenshots of the ACMG uh, guidelines uh, from 2015, uh, where they um, recommend that every lab that does, that does um, genetic analysis and sequencing, right, and whenever they come with certain changes in the DNA, they need to clarify, uh, classify it according to this five class um, system, right? And this is uh, mandatory for every lab. Now, what's the concept of genetic polymorphism? The DNA sequence of a given region of the genome is very similar among chromosomes carried by many different individuals from around the world. And any randomly chosen segment of human DNA, which is approximately 1,000 base pairs in length, contains, on average, only one base pair that is different between the two homologous chromosomes inherited from that individual's uh, parents. Some polymorphies are due to deletions, insertions, duplications, or translocations. So we talk about the DNA changes, right? But polymorphism is not a mutation because polymorphism, again, um, they may happen in no coding regions of the genes or they may be in coding regions of the genes, but uh, this does not affect the protein produced um, by these genes. So polymorphism, again, are common and they're benign, um, but these changes in the DNA may be deletions, insertions, duplications, translocations. The very similar changes changes in their nature, right? Nature, I mean, deletion or insertion, duplication or translocation may be causative for mutation because these changes, those, those changes that we call as true mutations or pathogenic changes um, happen in the regions of the genes that are in critical regions of the genes and they have deleterious or negative effects on the protein that they produce and they manifest a certain human disease. So whether a variant is considered a polymorphism or um, not uh, uh, polymorphism or not depends entirely on whether its frequency in a population exceeds one percent of the allele in that population. Uh, the sequence polymorphism may be located between the genes or within the introns, in the coding sequences of the genes, or in the regulatory regions as well. So polymorphies are key elements for the study of human and medical genetics. And the ability to distinguish different inherited forms of a gene or different segments of the genome provides critical tool for a wide array of applications. And they can be applied both in research and also in clinical practice. So we uh, apply the knowledge about polymorphism in different ways to map the gene for prenatal diagnosis, for detection of carriers, for blood banking or forensic, or of course for personalized medicine. Now um, let's discuss uh, different types of polymorphisms. Um, and the uh, diagram here um, uh, depicts different types of polymorphisms, right? Uh, common variations in the human genome. So these are single nucleotide polymorphisms, insertion deletions or so-called indels, copy number variants, and um, inversions. Talking about single nucleotide polymorphisms polymorphism or SNPs. These are the simplest and most common of all polymorphisms. And as we said, um, in about every thousand base pairs in the genome, we observe one SNP, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And of course, most are located in no conic parts of the genome, because we again realize that if we take entire human genome, uh, just 1.5% represent coding regions and 98.5% represent no coding regions. So if we take randomly every thousand base pair and we observe the difference between any two given individuals, 
well, consequently, this would be in, most of them would be in non-coding parts of the genome. Some SMPs are found in genes and functional elements of the genome. Um, a locus characterized by SNP usually has only two alleles, corresponds to the two different bases occupying uh, that particular location in the genome. And there are many millions of SMPs that have been identified and they have been cataloged uh, in different populations. And this diagram here nicely depicts the concept of SMP. We see four horizontal lines representing four different individuals. And then there is well, one locus, second and the third locus. And we see that some individuals in this locus contain C or others T. Then in another locus, it's G or A. And the third locus is G or A again. And this nicely represents single nucleotide polymorphisms. Again, even in this diagram, up here you have the reference sequence, right? And then you have this SMP, and of course it's two alleles, we have two alleles, right? And then we see that um, this person in one of the alleles has T, but the reference genome has, uh, has C, but the reference genome has T. So it's a polymorphism, it's a different letter, but this is not causing anything bad. So this is a common variant in the given population. Uh, for exonic SMPs, right, uh, they may be synonymous or non-synonymous. Synonymous means that they do not alter the predicted amino acid sequence of the encoded protein. And non-synonymous means they do alter the amino acid sequence. Other SMPs introduce or change um, a stop codon or alter a known splice site. Um, such SMPs may have significant functional consequences. The significance for health of the vast majority of SMPs is unknown. We do not know what are the consequences of SMPs, and most probably they do not really have any consequences. And But there are scientists who are doing research in this direction. And the fact that SMPs are common does not mean that they are without any effect on health or longevity. And many SMPs uh, may be involved in disease susceptibility, uh, but they do not directly cause some serious illnesses. There are also insertion deletion polymorphisms, or INDA, right? Um, uh, these are variations caused by insertion or deletion, INDELs. Um, of anywhere from a single base pair to up to 1,000 base pairs, um, although sometimes larger indels have been documented as well. And over a million of indels have been described. There are hundreds of thousands of indels in any one individual's genomes, and approximately half of all indels are referred to as simple because they have uh, only two alleles that is the presence or absence of the inserted or deleted segment. And on this diagram, um, it, we, we have for you this diagram in, in regards to SMPs, but here we have indel A and B. So looking up again in the reference sequence up here, and then we see um, indel A, right? And what, what, what is depicted here is that letter G is inserted here. See? So it's inserted between G and T. And if you look here, the letters are kind of reshuffled, right? And there is insertion in this individual compared to the reference genome. Whereas there is indel B and we see two green dashes. And it means that this individual, uh, two letters uh, are not there, right? It's deleted. But again, because these are mostly in no-coding regions, it is fine. I mean, this is just a variation between two individuals. and this is not causing anything bad because these are located in kind of non-coding non, non regions of the genome. But again, I want you to um, make emphasis that the similar change, right, insertion or deletion or even substitution like we have with SMP, right, if this happens in the protein coding genes and its critical uh, region, then this may have effect on the produced protein and um, it may manifest a certain phenotype or disease. Let's discuss what is microsatellite polymorphisms. 
right? Microsatellites, uh, we mentioned what these are, are short um, segments of DNA repeated about dozens of times in the uh, in particular site in the genome. And this uh, diagram here nicely summarizes different types of polymorphisms. And we see here microsatellite polymorphisms, right? Allele 1, 2, and 3. So what is depicted here is like a sequence of CAAs repeated four times. And there is another allele where we have uh, this repeat presented in six copies, and then allele 3, which has uh, this repeat uh, presented in five copies, right? Um, so microsatellites are used in DNA fingerprinting, right? And there are 13 different loci uh, for a DNA fingerprinting panel. And two individuals are so unlikely to have exactly the same allels at all 13 loci that the panel will allow definitive determination of whether two samples come from the same individual or not. And this means that because the fingerprints of every individual is unique, so are the certain DNA sequences where the copy numbers is unique for any individual. So this is why it's called DNA fingerprinting, because these microsatellite numbers of these repeats are unique for every human individual. And the information is stored in the FBI's combined um, DNA index system, which is called CODIS, uh, which uh, by December 2014 uh, includes over 11 uh, million um, uh, offender uh, uh, profiles, right? And many U.S. states um, and uh, depart uh, departments of defense have similar databases of DNA fingerprints um, and uh, in, in many other countries as well. And let's discuss mobile uh, element insertion polymorphisms or the mobile genetic elements or transposable elements or transposons. Um, nearly half of human genome consists of families of repetitive elements, large segments of repetitive uh, sequences. And two most common mobile element families are uh, ALU and line families of repeats. These mobile element polymorphisms are found on all human chromosomes. Uh, although most are found in non-genic regions of the genome, a small proportion of them are found within genes. Um, and let's discuss now copy number variants and later inversion polymorphisms. What are copy number variants? Uh, they consist of variation in the number of copies of larger segments of the genome. Variants larger than 500 KB are found in 5 to 10 percent of individuals in the general population. And variants that are more than one megabase are found in one or two percent. Smaller copy number variants, in particular, may have only two alleles, the presence or absence of a segment, and similar to indels in, in that regard. Larger copy number variants tend to have multiple alleles due to the presence of different numbers of copies of a segment of the DNA in tandem. The content of any two human genomes can differ by as much as 50 to 100 megabase because of copy number differences in um, copy number variant loci. And what are inversion polymorphisms? Um, these differ in size uh, from a few base pairs to large regions of the genome. And they can be present in either two orientations in the genome of different individuals. These polymorphisms do not involve gain or loss of a segment of the DNA and can achieve substantial frequencies in the general population. However, sometimes anomalous recombination can result in the duplication or uh, deletion of DNA located between the regions of homology. And this may be associated with clinical disorders. Now, um, let us go and uh, refer to 
the concept and types of mutation. So again, what is mutation? And of course, you will say mutation is a permanent change in the DNA. Yes, but just this is not enough to define what's mutation because the polymorphism is also a permanent change in the DNA and it's also inherited. Uh, and again, uh, I will repeat that mutations, their frequency in the population is less than 1%, right? And such changes are pathogenic changes. They are disease-causing changes. Whereas polymorphies, they are common and they may predispose, but sometimes they may not even cause anything. So mutation is any permanent heritable change in the sequence of genomic DNA that has deleterious effect on the encoding protein or the normal function of one uh, or more functions of the organism. And again, variant, it's an allele that differs from the wild type. So the basis of genetic function is the ability of the DNA to store, replicate, transmit, and decode information. But it is equally very, very important that DNA makes mistakes. So is mutation good or bad? Of course it's good. <laughs> of course it's bad, right? But um, sometimes even some, some mutations may even be bad and beneficiary. There are some, uh, we have such examples, of course, but most of the time, of course, mutations are uh, bad, they're deleterious. Um, because genetic mutations can lead to cell death, genetic diseases, and cancer. So mutations may be divided into spontaneous and induced mutations. Spontaneous are so-called accidental mutations. Uh, these are changes in the nucleotide sequence of genes that have no known cause. There is no specific agents associated with their occurrence. These are just accidental mutations. The mutations that happen and for some reason the repair mechanism could not correct them. And induced mutations may be a result of either natural or artificial agents. For example, different forms of radiation, um, natural or sy synthetic chemicals may damage the DNA. And so this we would refer to induced mutations. Um, the rate of spontaneous mutations is extremely low for all organisms. And the rate varies considerably between different organisms. And even within the same species, the rate of spontaneous mutations varies from gene to gene. And there are regions that we call, these are hotspots of mutations, the regions of the DNA, which is kind of more susceptible uh, for mutations. And um, we know that specific sites in the genome of an organism where the rate of certain mutations are high, these are hotspots of mutations, right? Um, for example, uh, some genes that are large in size, like DMD gene or NF1 gene, these genes are very large in size, in length, and thus the mutation rates are higher at this low side. And there is FGFR3 gene, which causes achondroplasia. Um, this is uh, a short lymph uh, dwarfism with normal intelligence. And why this one specific nucleotide appears to be so easily mutated, we do not know. You see here, glycine 380 arginine, this specific change in FGFR3 gene is, um, uh, is uh, most common uh, change in the FGFR3 gene that causes achondroplasia. And so we also understand that uh, there are uh, certain hotspots are these CGD nucleotides in the genome, right, which attract methyl group uh, and methylation of cytosines happens. And um, these are also hotspots of mutations. Uh, we can classify mutations based on the location uh, of uh, mutation. This may be somatic or germline mutations, right? Somatic that occur only in cells of the body, uh, but not in germ cells. And germline mutations, uh, these are the ones that occur only in the gametes, but not in somatic cells. And now here, the interesting thing is that if someone has somatic mutations, right, so some DNA mutations that arise in any of the somatic cells, these will manifest phenotypically, 
right? But somatic mutations are not transmitted from generation to generation because we transmit our, ge uh, our genetic information to next generation through our germline cells. And germline mutations, if, our, if the oocytes or spermatocytes contain mutations, they uh, do not manifest in an individual uh, himself or herself, but um, in, in their offspring, this may manifest as a disease. Mutations may be autosomal or X-linked, uh, whether they are located on autosomes or on X or Y chromosome. We can, as we said, we can classify mutations according to the size. As we said, chromosome mutations alter the number of chromosomes, but they do not alter the um, structure. Regional or subchromosome mutations that alter the structure of individual chromosomes, but they do not alter the number of chromosomes. And gene or DNA mutations that alter the sequences of the DNA. Right, um, and these are small segments, uh, insertions or deletions um, that may be one or several nucleotides, uh, maximum up to 100 kb. We can classify mutations based on the type of molecular change. This may be point mutations, frame shift, and expansion of three nucleotide repeats. Now, point mutation means that it involves single base substitution, one base pair. And there may be different subtypes of point mutations. So point mutation is a change of one base pair to another in a DNA molecule. And these are missense, silence, nonsense, transition or transversions, and single base pair deletion or insertion. Now, as you remember, missense mutation is the type of point mutation where single nucleotide changes result in a codon that codes for different amino acids. And a classical example is, for example, sickle cell disease, where in beta globin uh, gene, glutamic acid is substituted by valine. And here we see there is one base pair change Right, which results in a different amino acid. Silent mutation is a type of point mutation when the mutation alters the codon, but does not change the amino acid at that position in the protein. As we see here, it's in the second codon, for example, GAA codes for glutamine acid, and GAG also codes for the same amino acid. So there is a change in the codon, but there is no change in the amino acid. So it's silent. It does not have any, um, any consequences because it does not alter the uh, amino acid sequence in the protein. Uh, nonsense mutations is a type of uh, point mutation that causes the replacement of the normal codon by one of the three stop codons. So a single base pair change in the codon results in the formation of any of the stop codons. And then we understand that the um, uh, protein synthesis will stop at this point. Now, what is transition or transversion? Transition is when pyrimidine replaces pyrimidine or purine replaces purine, whereas transversion is when pyrimidine replaces purine or vice versa. And talking about single base pair insertion or deletion, um, as you see here, we have three DNA sequences. The middle one is normal DNA sequence, and the upper one we have insertion of one base pair of the C, right? And uh, we see that um, uh, from the point of insertion, the decoding system is totally reshuffled. So instead of like normal codon to be CAA, as we have in the middle, because of uh, the insertion of C, the decoding system will change and it will be CCA, and then it will be ATA, and so all the consequent amino acids will change. The similar will happen to with the situation when uh, if there is one base pair deletion, right? For example, there is A, uh, here and this A has been deleted and so you have C that occupies this place and then again um, the total decoding system is reshuffled.
So frame shift mutation is a type of mutation when the insertion or deletion is not the multiple of three letters. Uh, it's important that it's not multiple of three letters because again, decoding system, genetic code consists of three letter system, right? So whenever insertion or deletion is one or two or four or five base pairs and so on, right? But not three, six, nine, twelve, and so on, right? This will change the reading frame and this will result in abnormal protein. And either such situations, either we will have um, formation of the premature stop codon of the early stop codon, or um, due to this reshuffling, the uh, termination of the protein synthesis may take place later on at a um, distant place, and this will, of course, again form abnormal uh, abnormal protein. And finally, we need to say what is expansion of three nucleotide repeats or dynamic mutations. So a simple three nucleotide, three nucleotide means three letters, right? Um, these repeats may expand or generate multiple copies during gametogenesis within a given locus or, or a gene and interfere with normal gene expression of that gene. For example, let's take Huntington disease, right? And the repeat CAG, its normal uh, number of repeats in a, uh, in a gene, a specific it's a region of the gene, should be from 11 till 34. So some have 15, others have 25, others have 30. But if someone has over 36, up to 120, this is abnormal and increased number um, increased number interferes with normal gene expression and produces the disease. The similar can be said on uh, the listed um, other um, conditions, right? Free through hypoxia or myotonic dystrophy or fragile X syndrome, which I do mention quite often in regards to different um, um, examples, right? So um, these diseases, what they have in common is that they have some normal range of copy numbers of triplet repeats and then whenever the uh, expansion happens right or increase in the number then they cause the diseases and um, most common types of mutations arise um, during DNA replication when an incorrect nucleotide is inserted by DNA polymerase 3 if you remember replication, right, it's a doubling of DNA, and there is an um, enzyme which is called DNA polymerase, which polymerases or brings new nucleotides to the um, new strand of the DNA. And uh, we do realize and understand that most common, the source of most uh, majority of mutations are the DNA replication errors. And what happens is that when DNA, it's a, it's a very precise um, enzyme, it, it's very accurate, but sometimes it, it still makes mistakes. And what happens is that then uh, DNA polymerase itself will detect that there is error. And it will reverse its direction, it will remove the incorrect base pair and put the proper one. And this is called DNA proofreading. When DNA polymerase um, does its job, it elongates, it may bring the incorrect base pair and right away it corrects it. And we call this DNA proofreading. And it, this um, repair mechanism corrects 99% of the replication error. So it's very precise, right? Um, uh, and uh, proofreading improves the efficiency of replication by thousandfold, so it's very accurate and very important. Now, how often does DNA polymerase make an error during DNA replication? And such errors happen in every 10 million nucleotide pairs. It may sound um, it may sound uh, um, very um, uh, rare, but anyways, if if these errors are not corrected, so many abnormal things would accumulate that this would not enable the cell to proceed with uh, the cell cycle. So proofreading is extremely important mechanism to correct the um, formed 
errors and to allow the cell to progress through the cell cycle. So again, um, let us sum up that uh, there is a concept of polymorphism, and there is a concept of mutation. They have a very close border because the nature of the change is the same, whether it's deletion or insertion or substitution, right? Um, or deletion or insertion, but again, it all depends on whether such a change is common in the population, where is it located, whether it has any functional consequences, um, and these aspects that will define whether certain change is a polymorphism, or normal variation, or it's a mutation that this is causing change. Thank you for listening. I wish you all the best. Goodbye.